Hello, hello, and welcome to Politics and Prose Bookstore. My name is Nicole Davidow, and I'm an event staffer here at the store where, as you can clearly see, we are now hosting in-person events along with our virtual ones and partners events, trips, classes, all sorts of great stuff, uh, which can be found on our website at politics-prose.com. Uh, now, before I head into a formal introduction, a bit of housekeeping. First, a reminder to silence all your cell phones, beepers, Game Boys, whatever. Just make sure it's quiet. Uh, and then in terms of the mask mandate, masks are not required, but they are recommended just to keep community spread limited. Uh, if you don't have one and would like one, we do have some at the front of the store. In terms of run of show, after today's discussion, there will be an opportunity for Q&A. If you could just make sure to line up at the mic by this pillar over here so we can make sure uh, everyone hears the question and that our audio recording picks up on your question. Speaking of audio, we are both audio and video recording uh, this event, and it will be up on our YouTube channel if you want to share it around after the fact. Uh, after Q&A, we will have an opportunity to get your book signed. Signing line will just start right here. Uh, and if you would like to purchase a book, they are all behind the register and one of our wonderful booksellers can help you get one. Um, at the very end of the event, we do ask that to help out us staffers, you could just fold up your, actually, Never mind. we have an event later tonight. Don't fold up your chair, leave everything as is, thank you. Um, so now without further ado, tonight I'm honored to welcome Ramona Emerson in celebration of her first novel, Shudder. Emerson is a Dina writer and filmmaker hailing from New Mexico with an impressive career as a photographer, writer, and editor. Emerson is an Emmy nominee, a Sundance Native Lab Fellow, a Time Warner Storyteller Fellow, a Tribeca All Access grantee, and a WGBH Producer Fellow. In 2020, she was appointed to the Governor's Council on Film and Media Industries for the state of New Mexico. Emerson and her husband run their production company, Real Indian Pictures. Emerson will be in conversation with Sunjata Massey. Massey was featured, a features reporter for the Baltimore Evening Sun before becoming a full-time novelist. The first Parveen mystery novel, The Widows of Malabar Hill, was an international bestseller and won the Agatha, McCavity, and Mary Higgins Clark Awards. You can visit her website at sujatamassey.com. So please join me in warmly welcoming to Politics and Prose, Ramona and Sujata. Hello, everyone. <laughs> so good to see you. Thank you so much for coming out today. Um, and for being a fan of Shudder. <laughs> I appreciate that. I want to make sure you can hear this. Oh, it was perfect the way it was. <laughs> <laughs> I had to change it. Well, this is really um, wonderful to be here. And I want to thank you so much for coming today because you may know that we had to reschedule. There was a thousand year rainstorm in Texas which was your connecting spot because you live in Albuquerque and so we just found out hours before the event so I really want to thank so much for for your patience and to the bookstore also for rescheduling us because this is such an exciting moment <laughs> we've met before we met in Albuquerque right, right. Um, where you live <laughs> And it was in the months just before this book was going to be released. And there was so much excitement about you. Another cool thing is we are published by the same publisher, Soho Crime, which is a, a small publisher, small independent publisher that has just a really long track record of supporting all kinds of voices and telling stories from all around the world. So we share that, um, sort of we're kind of sisters in that way. Yes, like, we're Soho sisters. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I, I got your, I got an adva advanced copy of your book when I was there. And when I read it, I was so moved and I felt like it was very unlike any mystery I'd ever read. And I guess what I would say if I was trying to tell somebody about it is I would say, well, it's part mystery with a strong police aspect because your heroine is a forensic photographer working with the police it's part p 
paranormal. Mm -hmm. um, and then the last part that was really wonderful is a coming of age story because it goes between Rita's, um, you know, adult life, young adult life as this police for forensic photographer and how she how she came up in the countryside and her experiences. So I wanted to start by asking you whether this was a, a novel that was the story that you've been wanting to tell for a long time, or did you go through a number of ideas for novels before coming to this book? Um, actually, no. Um, I had, actually, this is my first book. Up until this point, I've been a filmmaker. So I've been writing screenplays, and I originally had thought of this as a documentary. I was thinking I was going to make a documentary about uh, Navajos who work in industries that deal with death. So if you know anything about um, Navajo belief systems, they're very, death is a very taboo subject. And I thought, well, it'd be very interesting to make a documentary about people who work in the forensic industry, on uh, Navajos who work as police officers, Navajos who work as doctors, pathologists, jobs like that, and how they deal with the taboo of death. Um, but I quickly found out that nobody was going to talk to me about that. <laughs> <laughs> and it would be a very boring documentary. Um, and at the same time, I was also writing short stories about my grandmother um, and then writing kind of short stories about kind of creepy things, uh, ghost stories, uh, superstition stories, uh, and also stories about my own experiences. Um, I worked as a forensic videographer in Albuquerque for uh, 16 years. And so all of that coming together in conjunction with me getting my MFA um, in fiction culminated into this book. Um, I didn't know it was going to be a novel. I had no intention of being a writer or a novelist at all. I went into my MFA program thinking I was going to study screenwriting. Um, and a mentor of mine, Joan Tewksbury, um, basically said, why are you going into screenwriting? You can do that already. Like." make something out of all these stories you're writing in workshop, because I was in a writing workshop with her. And um, so I did. I applied to the program, fiction program, with what I had, my short stories and stuff I had been writing in, um, in my writing workshop. And within the first two weeks of that semester, I knew exactly what this book was going to be about, because I had all of these pieces. And once I was in a fiction class, and I had an instructor, Eden Robinson, who kind of talked to me about structure, I realized, oh my gosh, this is a novel. And it just started to come together. And like you say, it's like four novels in one because it's coming from so many different um, directions and so many different angles. Um, it just kind of magically turned into this um, through me just putting all of my experiences into it and figuring out how, to, how they would play off of each other. And then I thought, as a Diné, as a Navajo person, how would it be, knowing that death is such a taboo thing, what would it be like if you could talk to people who had crossed over as a Navajo person? Like, how would other Navajos treat you? Um, what would, how would they look at you um, moving forward? And I thought, oh my gosh, what an isolating experience and what a great thing to write about. Um, so that's how it all came together. Just. It just happened that way. Yeah, I remember the first time we met, which was a few months ago. It was in April in Albuquerque. Mm -hmm. We went out to dinner at this wonderful restaurant, in Los <laughs> Poblanos. If anyone has ever goes to Albuquerque, it's just <laughs> that's it's the spot set, set in these lavender fields. And you started telling real ghost stories. I mean, you honestly had us all like this. <laughs> like one of your your simplest ghost stories that was really really funny is you said that one time you were editing film. And this this coffee cup. You want to tell the coffee? Just tell that story. It's <laughs> yeah. I mean, and this was this was after I had written the book. Like the first draft was done. I had just graduated from my MFA program, and I had never had a paranormal experience before. I had written about it in the book. I had seen it on TV. I've watched a million n uh, movies about ghosts, but I had never had a personal experience. So uh, my husband and I were doing a film workshop with. Um, a bunch of young teenagers for the summer. And in the second week, we do all of, an ed all of the editing. So we were in an editing room at the Institute of American Indian Arts. 
And it was me uh, and two of my teaching assistants were there. And it was early morning. We were turning on all the computers and getting ready for our students to come in to edit. Um, and I heard this rustling behind me. And in between this room of computers, there's a long conference table that kind of takes out the middle of the room. And I heard this rustling, and I turned, and I watched my coffee mug move all the way down the, cof uh, the, cof the uh, conference table. And it just stopped at the edge with a little bit of it hanging over. And <gasps> I, I was so freaked out. I, uh, um, I wouldn't have believed it, but my other assistant was behind me, and I was like, Pijan, Pijan. <laughs> and she was like, I'm watching it. I saw, I saw it, too. And we just watched this cup move all by itself. Um, and that was my first kind of ghostly experience. Um, and this was after I'd written the book. So in revisions, I think I kind of um, pulled some of that fear and some of that terror I had at that moment um, into the book, into the, la the, the later revisions, because I had never had my own experience until that moment. Yeah, that's, that's incredible. When something goes on in your life that you can somehow, it, it, you understand the work that you're trying to do better. Right. Yes. And um, that in particular was just, I don't know, there was something about that feeling. It was like the, your heart just kind of sinks into your stomach. <laughs> and you can't really do anything about it. And then you're wondering, is it still here? Mm -hmm. um, and for the two days before that happened, we kept having issues <laughs> with like a couple of the computers we would edit pieces and they would disappear. We were never able to export the final versions. And um, you know, <laughs> and then this happened. So we smudged the room like every day <laughs> after <laughs> that. And the computers, we were so freaked out. You know, so we smudged it out every day um, to keep that from happening again. But there's obviously something there at that place. Um, there's some old spirits mm -hmm. there that just want to say hi. Yeah, and the hotel that was for the convention, that that was n a known to be extremely haunted hotel, yeah. right? It was a Hyatt that was built on the grounds of an old um, bordello. Right. right. So <laughs> there was just a lot of bad energy, and our editor's door, our editor kept getting locked out of her room. Right. Yeah. So and they, they had no, and and honestly, the security person was like, well. The, the, it would be locked from the inside. It would be yeah. dead bolted. I mean, it was just, we had a lot of magical stuff. And <laughs> it, that, it's all in this book, but it's more, uh, but it all, it plays, it tells a story. It's right. not, you know, it, it's, it's really special. And, and one thing I wanted to ask you about is more about the photography aspect of the book. And one thing that's very sweet is when Rita is a young girl and she's living with her her mother and her grandmother both have ties to the photography world. And there's a really special camera, like sort of like a handmade camera. Could you tell us a little bit more about that and whether you actually ever had a camera like that? Yeah, I mean, there, I think chapter four. Uh, chapter four is called Paper and Box. And it is about, um, you know, what you can do. You can actually take a picture. It's called a pinhole camera. And um, when I was probably six or seven years old, um, my stepdad and my mom sh took a photograph of me with a pinhole camera. And I'll never forget it. I still have the photograph. Um, I'm kind of sitting in this chair with a hole in it, so my butt sinking in. Um, but they took this photograph of me, and I was always fascinated by that, the fact that you could put photographic paper inside a box, and there's just a little tiny hole poked on one side, and you cover it with tape and you put the paper in it, and when you uncover it, it exposes the paper on whatever image that you've, you're showing. And I thought that that experience for me was so, uh, I guess so visceral, just realizing that you can make images out of nothing. And I knew that I had to bring that story in. For, for the book, I, I made it with the grandma. My grandma didn't do that with me, but my mother did. Uh, so. And um, they used to do all kinds of interesting stuff with cameras and, and video. And so I just wanted to have that be an experience. Um, but every single, when you read the book, you'll notice that every single chapter has a different camera model in it. And if you're curious about what year it is in the book, because it goes back and forth between her childhood and her present day, all you have to do is type that model of the camera in, and it'll tell you what year it is. <laughs> so. Um, it was a great way for me to hook in photography and also to like kind of hook people into um, all the different camera models and all the different ways that you can create images. And uh, it's fascinating to me um, as a filmmaker 
and I guess as a photographer as well. Um, but I, I just wanted to bring that passion into it and, and, and just kind of show how Rita is so obsessed with the, the, the image. So this is making me, I don't have a question for you. This wasn't just, just kind of spontaneously arising. Okay, say you're seven years old and on the table in front of you, there's a, like a paper and a pen, like a book, a little journal for making stories. And there is one of those little Kodak Instamatic cameras. What would you reach for? And like, what was, I'm basically I'm trying to get, what was your first love? Was it photography or was it writing? Absolutely photography. Um, absolutely, and, and filmmaking as well because I was obsessed with films and I've made my grandma take me to like the worst films, like <laughs> The Shining and stuff like that. And she would like, I would take her and she would just be shocked like, you're eight years old. Why am I taking you to see this? And I would just beg. I, w I wanted to see that kind of stuff. But I hate writing. I know I'm a writer and I'm fairly good at it, but it's not one of my favorite activities. I've never liked it. Maybe it's because I've been writing grants all my life for mm -hmm. film. Nothing will make you hate writing more than writing grants for 25 years. Um, but um, I've never been much of a writer. I'm good at it and I know I can do it. And it, people have always encouraged me to be a writer, telling me, you're really good at it. You should do more of this. But it took this long to convince me to actually write a book mm -hmm. because I didn't think I could do it. I thought I was a filmmaker. I'm used to telling stories with images, with sound. Um, and this was a big transition for me. But in the same way, I think it was also a very freeing transition because um, I'm able to sit at a computer and tell you all a story. And it costs me no money. <laughs> you when, you, when you're making a film, you have to beg 800 people for a little bit of money so that you can go out and tell that story. And so it's a lot more, it's a lot easier for me to tell a story on page uh, financially. Mentally, maybe not. <laughs> it's, but, you know, uh, it, but writing and putting my story down in words has been a big transition for me. And um, I think it's been a good transition. And I'm, I think I'm happy to make that transition. I'm getting to be at an age where I don't want to haul cameras and equipment around anymore and I'm tired of filming everything and uh, I'm tired of all the 200,000 pounds of gear that I carry with me <laughs> everywhere. So it's nice to just have a laptop yeah. and, and tell a story that way. And I think like for me, m my experience of reading your book is it's very cinematic at times when there like there's this incredible chase scene toward the end of the book where Rita is trying to get away from the bad guy. And she goes, these, and I was really happy. It was places that I thought I knew in Albuquerque, like sen on Central <laughs> Avenue. And, um, but I, uh, but she, the way, the way you tell that story would translate really well to film. And I also think that you may have a better, um, a, a, sort of like a knack at ending chapters on a suspenseful note and so on, because <laughs> When you make your films, you have to keep elevating people's interests, right? Yes. So I think that it, it worked out really well. And, and you know, it's I'm glad you wanted the camera. I, I loved having a camera. You know, I got my first Instamatic probably when I was about 11 or 12. Mm -hmm. um, but I would have gone for the notebook. <laughs> so we would not have had a fight when we were um, at the same table. No, we would have. We could have, you know, written a, an illustrated book. Yeah, you, right. <laughs> you could have done that. We, we could or have filmed it. You could have wrote the screenplay. And we could have yeah, filmed it. We could have done it one or the other way. <laughs> yeah, that would have been, been incredible. It would have been so fun. Power. Oh yeah. my gosh, that would have been so fun. <laughs> so tell me a little bit more about um, Rita and whether there were any experiences that you drew on from your life or somebody you knew to come up with this really fascinating character who has to hide so much um, because she knows so much and she knows she gets a bad reaction. Right. Right. Well, um, like I said, I, I worked in forensics for 16 years, but I worked for a private firm, so I didn't work for APD, for Albuquerque Police. I worked, I did work for them, but on a secondary level. I w and um, so I did a lot of like videotape depositions. I spent a lot of time under vehicles measuring skid marks and uh, it was just awful work, I'm not going to lie, for 16 years. But um, it, it allowed me time to work on documentary. My boss would let me take equipment out of the shop, and I was able to go film documentaries with them for many years, and that helped. But I think I took a 16-week class 
in, at, uh, in Albuquerque, at the Albuquerque Police Department. They, they have a civilian class you can take. Um, and you can learn everything you need to know about how to uh, examine a crime scene. And so for 16 weeks, I attended this class and learned everything about blood spatter, ballistics, uh, of course, photography, um, everything you need to do to work a scene and how to, and how to you know, look at a crime, how to, how to photograph it, how to document it, how to diagram it, everything. Um, and in the process of taking that class, we actually learned a lot of local um, cases. We were actually shown photographs of these cases. Um, we were brought in, we saw the case files, we saw the diagrams, all of that. Um, and so the first chapter is actually, first chapter and several other chapters, the crimes are actually taken from real things that happened in Albuquerque. In particular, that first chapter um, was the first case we saw at the APD crime school. Um, and I was just, I think we probably lost about six or seven people <laughs> that yeah. first night because they were showing the photographs from this horrible scene where somebody jumped over the overpass and was basically just scattered all over. Um, and for me, I was just shocked, but I wasn't shocked in a way that I was just, you know, didn't want to deal with it. I was shocked that that these they were able to do this and they were able to catalog all this woman's parts and how, and it was cold, it was winter, and how does that work? And mm -hmm. it immediately just like made me think about all the details and like how I would say that, how I would put that into a book without scaring anybody too bad, but really make people understand what it's like when you work that kind of job and you're in the highway and you're out there for hours at a time photographing pieces of people sometimes or, or people who are, have passed over. And, and it's, it's disturbing, yes, and it's hard work. It's awful sometimes to be in those situations, but I used to get freaked out when I was working in forensics. Like the first two years, my call my grandma all the time. Like uh, you wouldn't believe what I saw, and she'd be like, "Why are you doing this? You aren't even supposed to be doing this work." She would get so mad at me because she knew that I was doing this kind of work, and I would have to go to the medicine man, and I would have. I mean, there was like some real issues like those first couple years, but after that, I realized that my job is not to dwell on death or to worry about death as an action of death or how these people came. My job is to make sure that I document everything correctly and that everything's measured correctly, the color and, the, and everything is measured correctly so that they get justice. It's my job to make sure that their case is documented, that whatever is gonna happen for their case moving forward, that I do a, well, a good enough job that they'll get the justice they need. Their family will get the justice they deserve. And so, it took a couple of years to realize how important that work is, and that's the reason. So I got over that fear of death. I got over that fear, or I guess just the the horror of seeing some of that stuff that I would see. Um, yeah, it was kind of gross in some cases, and I and I would freak out a little bit, but I would always bring myself back to this is the job. This is the job. This is what you do. If you don't do this job, then they may not get a good case outcome. So you better get to work. <laughs> And so I just put that mentality into Rita. And that I think was the driving force that kept her moving through the story. She knew that even though she's horrified by some of this and like the ghosts and these different people are speaking to her and this is all very harsh for her as a Navajo woman dealing with all of this, in her mind she knew that not only Irma but everyone else mm -hmm. that she works for deserves justice. And so that was her driving force. And it was something I pulled from my own work, um, working in forensics and dealing with that kind of stress every day and, and dealing um, with the cases and the people that you deal with. You take those cases home with you. And I'm not gonna lie, I had nightmares and I would think about these people for years to come. Um, so it's just something that you, it's really hard to let mm -hmm. go of. We just had a thing happen in Baltimore last week. It was in the newspaper that there was a forensic technician who was retired who was asked to come back and testify in cases you know since her, she retired in 2020 mm -hmm. and she didn't want to do it and she was saying it's because of the trauma she was like I cannot go back to those places in my mind yeah. and so what, hearing you talk about it it seems very clear so in a way this book is it, it must have been very scary to write at certain times <laughs> 
Yeah, I think it was, but I think it's also cathartic because mm -hmm. I was able to put a lot of this stuff that disturbed me on, on paper and I was able to get it out and talk about it, which is something I'd never done ever before. Mm -hmm. So I just kind of put it into Rita, um, you know, but it, it is kind of traumatizing and people always ask me that. I'm like, do you take that? Do you take all that with you? And you do. You can't help it. You can't help it. You can ask a doctor or, you know, a, f a police officer, um, you know, their own experiences and they'll tell you the same thing. It's like you can't help but take it with you. You'll see those people's faces for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. And um, I still see people's faces that I worked on. And a lot of them are kids. Those are the ones that get me are the cases that involve kids. And it wasn't, they weren't always deceased. A lot of them were alive and they were injured and, and it was my job to film their injuries or I did a lot of these things called day in the life documentaries where you'll spend an entire day or two living with this person and their family. Maybe there was a medical malpractice case or uh, an injury at birth, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And you spend the day so you can see how their family has to feed them now. They have a fifth, like they could have a teenage son that got in a car accident. Now they're, now they're paralyzed and their parents have to feed them every day and you know, and they have to brush their teeth and like stuff like that because they can't do anything anymore. And that was my job. I'd have to go spend days with them and I edit that piece together. And my job was to make sure that it never got to trial because they knew that once this video was entered as evidence and a jury saw it, that they would get a ton of money. <laughs> so my job was to make it so horrible and so awful to show the impact that they would settle the case before it even got to trial. Um, so that's a big responsibility because you know that these people, these families are gonna need millions of dollars to maintain that level of care and into their adulthood. And if you don't help them win their case, what are they gonna do? How are they gonna care for their child? How are they gonna care for their parent? Whatever it is. Yeah, yeah you're really kind of opening my thinking about what forensic careers are about and about, you know, it's, it's not just that to take something to the prosecutor right. or, you know, <laughs> right. or, or it's just, there's a whole, different aspect to it. And one of the things that I I remembered a reading a few times in the book is there were numerous people who said to Rita, you shouldn't do this job because of being Navajo or this mu or even her supervisor who liked her a lot said this must be really hard for you. And my first take on it was oh, it's some it's some kind of discrimination because when I was a young Looking for my first job, which was going to be as a reporter, I remember interviewing at a place and they said, well, what have you done so far? And I said, well, I was an intern doing police reporting for the Baltimore <laughs> Evening Sun. And they said, oh, well, the cops don't like the, the cops don't like women here oh. in in Raleigh. So <laughs> we don't put women on the police beat. So like my whole take on it was that I couldn't it, uh, did I want to go to a newspaper where they would never allow women to talk to the police. And I was like, uh, no, I don't want to go there. So my first thought was it was a discrimination. Like for some reason they thought that. And I wanted to ask you more to dig into that, why it would be so hard for somebody, Navajo, um, Diné, to yeah. do this. Well, uh, we have a very deeply embedded belief system that believes that death is a very taboo subject. We don't talk about death. When people die, it's just, it's very, you, you separate yourself from them immediately. It's like you don't say their names. You, you don't talk about them anymore. Um, you can't touch them. When s once they've gone, you can't touch them. There's all these rules to how Navajos deal with death. And the Diné have always had this fear in, of, of death. And you, I mean, you can't even say it. You can't even talk about it. Like the, if I was saying like that in front of my grandma, talking about somebody that just passed, they'd be like, don't you you don't you know you don't shh, don't Janita, don't talk about that that kind of thing. I was like that. We get scolded if we would talk about things like that. So when I I was thinking about writing this story, I was so afraid of how my own people would take this book it, if they would even read it. Um, it would if, if it was just too much taboo, too much death, too much everything. Just the fact that I'm writing about it was awful. The fact that I had that job for 16 years was so horrible for my grandmother. Um, so I was afraid of how that, how that would blow over. But over the course of the time, the 10 years it took to write this book, um, I did a lot of research about the beliefs, in the, the, the Diné beliefs in death and that whole system and how it was created and, and how we came to believe these things. 
And I, I, I saw or I noticed that a lot of this negativity came on after the Spanish flu came through the Navajo Nation in the late 1800s. And a lot of the belief systems and the traditions and things that go along with our death beliefs now are really linked to that event in particular. And I begin to realize that maybe this is really something that we as, the ne we as Navajo people need to really face. And yes, it's going to be hard, and we're going to be afraid. And it, death is a, f a scary thing for everyone, not just for us. And it's something that we need to stop avoiding, and we need to and we need to deal with because I think over the course of this 100 years, that we've lost our traditions, we lost the way we we originally felt about death and how we pass over into next worlds, and how we become a different being and we we transcend this world. That's how I know we believed before the Spanish flu. Now it's this horrible thing and we don't want to deal with it. We don't want to talk about it. And I think things like the, f like the funeral industry have taken advantage of that in our community. And um, I think because we believe these things now, they're, they're using it to their advantage. They're making sure that we're able to, like, because we don't want to deal with it, right? When so one, of one of our loved ones die, we don't want to deal with it. So they'll take care of everything and they'll charge us a whole bunch of money to do it. And they're down for that. They're like, that's, that's good for them. That's good for their business. It doesn't necessarily mean it's good for us. And we need to really need to think about how traditionally we really dealt with that way back before all of this happened and get back on track to our traditional beliefs instead of um, being in fear of it, which I think is something that we learned to do. Um, so I'm hoping that this book is a good catalyst for that, that it'll, it'll make people think about it and not such a not such a horrible way you know really think about death and how we deal with it and how we can make that transition easier for our family and our family members um so in that way i hope it creates some change and some discussion within our own community yeah. and i want to add that I, I i felt very upbeat at the end of the book <laughs> just despite we're talking about you're talking about really serious issues but you do it in such a compassionate way and the characters are warm, and there there are moments of humor, and um, I think it's just I enjoyed it so much. And I wanted to invite the audience if anybody has any questions. We've got a a microphone right there, but on the other side of this pole. Um, if anyone wants to come up and ask Ramona anything. Hi, Hello. I've got a few questions. Okay. Number one, do you list some of your documentaries in the book? No, I don't. I don't even mention the, that fact <laughs> at all in there. Um, but yes, and um, we're working on our eighth one right now. I'm curious about those. I'm also curious about the necklace you're wearing. Can you tell us about that? <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, so yesterday was my birthday. Well, happy birthday. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and I had been eyeing this lovely squash blossom for many, many, many months. And um, my husband surprised me with it yesterday. Aww. But this is a very traditional squash blossom and it's very heavy. It's real silver it and like it. it's extremely heavy. Um, but it it's I just, I've had it for less than 24 hours and it's like my most prized possession. <laughs> Can you tell us a story <laughs> around it? I mean, it's, it looks symbolic. Well, you know, it's, there's so many different things um, about this and as there's so many different elements to it. I think a lot of people just, um, especially this particular um, symbol here is just so, I, I, I feel like if you look way, 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 way back before the Spanish even came, there were Moorish people that came to the Navajo Nation and that visited that whole trail of trade that went all the way from South America all the way up to Canada and it goes right through to Mexico. And I believe this, this design really came from them. If you look at a lot of their crescent designs and things that came from those that, that time period, it, it's very well related to this, this here. But this was made pro many, many years ago. It's a very old piece. And I, ha I found it in a, um, a pawn store in Albuquerque. Now these guys, they've had this forever and it's like been their, their big prize that's up on the wall that nobody wants to buy. And um, so, People, Navajos, Pueblos, come into those places and sell their wares all the time. And you'll find some really beautiful stuff that's been sitting in there a long time. And this is one of <laughs> them. Well Thank you so much. I know I, s I really like it. It's just, it's, um, 
it's I just love it. And so oh, it's Andy. it's yes, the big it's premiere. Quite beautiful. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, if you wanna if you wanted to visit um, our website, we at we're at realindianpictures.com and you can see or find a link to almost all of our documentaries on that page. The only one you can't find, I believe, is The Mayors of Shiprock because we don't, it's uh, a PBS film and uh, you can I think you can only find it on Amazon now. You can get it on Amazon Prime. Okay, I'm gonna get the net, the, that website that you just said okay. mentioned. Okay, it's R-E-E-L, -E yes, Indian it's Pictures. Yes. Indian Pictures, okay. yes. real Indian Pictures. One more question, <laughs> I'm sorry, um, is, did you get any message from that cup moving? I mean, did you feel it was some <laughs> message for you? <laughs> you know, I I don't, but I I um I felt like it kind of could have been um like the spirit of this gentleman that had passed away a year before, and he was kind of a crazy guy. His name was um, Bill Souza, Bill um, War Soldier, and. Um, he he passed away just a year before that and he'd be the type that would do something like that and he would hang around IAIA and he would do that something like that to me and I was like I wonder if that's wild bill like moving my cup because that's something that he would do but it's an you know Albuquerque and Santa Fe are old places and I'm going there next and month it's <laughs> full of history and it, it, it's full of a lot of things and um, I think there's a lot of old souls there wonderful thank you <laughs> Yes, thank you. you. You've already answered my question because I was going to ask you about the necklace also. Oh. Bec because I wasn't sure whether a squash blossom had to have turquoise or not. Yeah. No, apparently not. <laughs> <laughs> I, there was a lot of those. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, well, uh, my, my, my partner is from Gallup. Oh, and, okay. she, and so I've been to Gallup a good number of times and, and Albuquerque as well. And, and I bought a squash blossom with turquoise at auction for her, and so she was very pleased with that too. So it, they're good to get secondhand, apparently. Yes, because yes. yeah, because the old way of making it, yes. you can only get them that way. Nowadays, they're they're a lot cheaper made. They're they're not as no. they're not the the craftsmanship isn't yeah, there, no. um, and there's always most squash blossoms have turquoise yeah. and they have a lot of bling to them. I'm just like old school, and I like. Just plain silver. Yep. I don't like too much turquoise it's and very coral. Handsome, isn't it? <laughs> and looks well on you. Sir. Thank you so Thank much, you. sir. Thank you so much. I was able to get your book out of the Cleveland Park Library this week, and I'm about two thirds of the way through it. Oh, good. Um, I was, and I don't want to give anything away here, but I was curious as to why, in chapter 17, Rita has this reassuring interview with Internal Affairs, and the following chapter goes back to her childhood with the unpleasant encounter with with uh, Rodrigo's death. Can you tell me why you did it that way? Why you didn't reverse them? Or <laughs> <laughs> I think I really made it intentional that we go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Okay. So you'll never you'll never see two present day chapters right, right. next to each other. Never. Um, so I should just keep reading. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and you'll. Once you get past, I think it's like chapter 26, okay. you'll notice that the camera models will change and we're only in the present day. Okay. And so there will be, up to that point, it goes back and forth, okay. back and forth. So the time will stay the same if I give it patience. Yes, okay. but just a few more chapters and then we'll be all present day. Okay. <laughs> You're almost there. <laughs> You talked yes, about how your family reacted when you were working in forensic uh, <laughs> uh, photography, and how have they reacted to your book now that it is finished? Well, I'm so sorry that my grandma wasn't alive to see the book, because she was the one that was the most f afraid for me. Um, and I, r I started writing the book after she had passed away. So she never had the chance to see it and to hear it. Um, but I don't, I think she would be okay with it. I think, and I think her thing was with me, was she always, my grandma was the one who taught me how to read. Mm -hmm. And she was always very supportive of me writing more than my filmmaking. She really liked me to write and to read. Um, it was very important to her. And so I feel like this is a good tribute for her because I feel like she would have really enjoyed the fact that I've, telling stories about the two of us that we had experiences together 
and that um, I was able to translate that into it. She, <laughs> she came to terms with the fact that I was doing the work I was doing. Um, and I told her the reason why I was doing it was so I could get the equipment to make my documentaries. So she understood that there was this underlying need that I had. Um, and she came to terms with that. And I also came to terms with the fact that I didn't need to tell her about every single thing I saw. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because I think that freaked her out and it made it worse for her. And I didn't want to do that to her. So I would just not tell her about all the horrible things I was photographing. Um, she knew I was doing it, but she didn't ask and I didn't tell. And I think we had, it was better that way. <laughs> I didn't want to stress her out. <laughs> um, I think she'd be kind of, I think she'd like it. She'd be a little shocked at first. My mom is fine with it. My mom grew up letting me watch like the worst horror movies ever. And um, we continue to watch really bad horror movies. And uh, my mom is like super excited about it. <laughs> and beyond shock. <laughs> and big on shock. Yeah, she was. She loves all of the forensic stuff. And yeah. she watches all that forensic stuff with me. So she, nothing, my mom's like, whatever. And uh, one other <laughs> question. You, I was interested in your um, research that indicates that the fear of death, the taboo around death, traces to the Spanish flu rather than farther back in history or prehistory. And have you made any efforts to teach that to fellow Navajos or in a documentary or in any other form? No. No, I have not. Um, because I don't think that's widely known. No, I don't think so. And I don't think, I mean, I, th I think there'll probably be some um, Navajos that'll disagree with me. They'll probably say, oh, that's not true. You know, everybody's got their own opinion and I'm sure their own um, historical remembrance of how things went. And um, I'm sure there are there people will argue with me about it, but I still am very staunch in believing that it's something we need to talk about and we need to stop hiding from it and we need to start dealing with it. Um, and I was, I think two weeks ago, I had um, an event um, in Gallup, New Mexico, like which is about 20 miles from my, my hometown of Tohatchee. And a mentor of mine, Dr. Danette Dill, um, had me uh, do an event at the trading post in Gallup. Yeah. <laughs> and and then before that, we sold books at the flea market, which was where everyone, all the novels go on Saturdays, right? Go to the flea market. And we set up a booth at the flea market. I was thinking, oh gosh, no one's gonna care about this book. Everyone's coming to buy mutton stew and fry bread, and they don't care about some book <laughs> in the corner of this, the flea market. But so many people came, mm -hmm. and we sold out of the book. And half of them, it had to be half of them, were from Tohatchee. And I was so happy. I, I can't even tell you how happy I was to see Dene coming in and buying the book and not knowing what it's about, but still buying it and being interested in I can't wait to read it kind of attitudes. I, I it was such a sense of relief. And then when we went to when we went to the trading post later, that was another thing. I was like, I can't believe I'm doing an event at the trading post. Is that like a tourist place? <laughs> kind like kind of. of exploitative? Is <laughs> yeah. that what it is? Well, like you know, it's <laughs> like the traders, you know, the white traders came in and they all set up shop and they all married Navajos and they have big giant turquoise necklaces and you could buy concha belts bigger than your head and all that kind of stuff, you know. And it is kind of a weird little place of like a, a colonial little passage there that's mm -hmm. like this building Ellis Tanner is like one of the oldest traders in our in the, in the area so I was a little freaked out by that like there how is this gonna work but so many novels came and wanted their books signed and were interested in in this book and Dr. Danette Dale says don't you can't they can try to talk all kinds of crazy about your traditional beliefs and how you shouldn't be talking about death and all of that. But when it comes down to it, we all know they go home and watch The Walking Dead <laughs> and they watch CSI. And you know, it's so far embedded into our society that there's no way that they can avoid it. And it, it's, this is a good time for you to launch this idea and think about how can we you know, get back to how we used to believe. Yeah, Thanks. so thank you, great question. I'll ask another one if nobody else has anything okay. to say. And any, uh, I, knew, I knew the Republican Lujans when I worked on Capitol Hill. And uh, 
they were good friends of Tony Hillerman. Do you have any yes. relationship with uh, the Hillermans or uh, any encouragement or support? Uh, absolutely not. I okay, do not. Sure. Uh, <laughs> um, I mean, you know, Hillerman for many years. Um, unfortunately, for many years, we didn't have a lot of Navajo or Native authors, right. which is something that's changing, th thankfully. There's a lot of indigenous talent that are putting fi a lot of fiction and poetry and all kinds of things out. So I, I encourage you to search those people out. But for years, you'd go to the Native section of a bookstore, and all you would find is Tony Hillerman books. And for me, growing up on the Navajo Nation, my grandma would always say, who's talking to this guy? Like, who's telling him all this stuff? Because this is stuff that we shouldn't be talking about. Like, we're, we shouldn't be. This is not stuff that should be written down or talked about. But this guy is making all kinds of money off of it. Why, why is that happening? Um, and so that's, I think, a belief I carried into my adulthood. And so when I hear about, like, they're doing the big Tony Hillerman Dark Wind series on TV right now. And it was like, it's so for me, it's a little, it's... Tony Hillerman has just been this thing that has existed, um, but he is not Diné, and he took a lot of stories and family histories from Diné people and made a lot of money off of them, and I just can't support that. I've never, I've never, I had to read one Tony Hillerman book for high school, <laughs> and I never read another one, and that, the only reason I read that is because it was a requirement, um, but I just feel like, you know, there's a ton of DNA storytellers out there. We just haven't been noticed yet. There are new experiences and new stories. Right. And, you know, new, new talent, new stories. And the cool thing about it is you'll know that the auth authenticity is there because the DNA writers are writing about the place they come from. You know, that's their home. That's everything to them. That's their family. That's their life. That's their story. That's their traditions. That's their belief. Um, for Tony Hillerman, it was some secondary story that somebody told him, and maybe he slipped him a 20 or whatever. That's not Dene storytelling. So I would encourage you all to look for stories that come from the communities that the stories are coming from, because that is the truest form of storytelling. And there's so many new n um, books coming out and authors coming out, and I encourage you, you know, get out there and read them, because they're incredible. You're here. <laughs> I think on that fantastic note, we will close out. Thank you all once again for an incredible discussion. Uh, once again, there are books at the back counter. If you'd like to purchase one, we can do some signing, and we'll come around to help personalize. Thank you all for coming. Thanks, everyone.